Uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, nice to uh, come back to uh, Sujo and uh, to be so proud to see how well this uh, institution uh, is, uh, is doing. It's, uh, it's a great honour for me. And it's, uh, it's particularly nice to be able to, to say as well, of course, that my current institution, the University of Oxford, is now also going to have a presence uh, on uh, SIP. And uh, I look forward as well to being involved in, in that. When Liverpool and Sian Jaitong were uh, talking about uh, setting up this university, uh, one, one of the key decisions we had taken that it was, was that it was going to be a real partnership. It was a partnership of two strong universities, uh, and it wasn't about one university dominating uh, another. So I've been asked to talk this morning about the UK undergraduate education system, and the last thing I want to do is to give the impression that I'm saying this is the way to do it. Uh, I'm describing one system, uh, and it's for you to see whether uh, you want to take from that system uh, or whether you want to reject it or perhaps take some bits from it uh, and leave uh, other bits uh, uh, out. Now, the, uh, the delivery of undergraduate uh, uh, education in the UK is by no means uh, uniform across all the universities in the UK, but uh, I think it is now fairly uniform in uh, theory and principle, and th that principle is of uh, student-centred uh, uh, education, uh, closely related to what we also call problem-based or scenario-based uh, education, not, not necessarily quite the same thing as student-centred, uh, but these three ideas are very closely related and they're pretty central to what happens in most universities uh, in the UK. Before we get into the, into the, the detail, the nitty-gritty of what that actually means, uh, perhaps we should ask a question about what the intended output uh, actually uh, is. And I think the idea is that student-centred education should not produce clones of the teachers, so that you shouldn't have 20 people in one class who all think exactly the same way as the person who is teaching that class. That, that is the fundamental idea of, uh, I think, at least, of student-centred uh, education. So you provide the skills and the knowledge of the teacher but as reinterpreted by each uh, individual uh, student. And the next question, I suppose, is, well, why is that a, why is that a good thing? Um, one reason is that I think uh, uh, psychologists have suggested that people are more comfortable in using skills, uh, not just remembering them, uh, if uh, these skills are genuinely internalized. Uh, they belong to the student, uh, not as it were just to, to the teacher and somehow or other taken over by the student, but genuinely internalized. And then we can, we can not only remember things better, but we feel more free to use them, uh, to interpret them for our own, uh, our own purposes. But I think there's another reason not, not uh, talked about so much, but really quite important. And that is that uh, this method of teaching produces a kind of biodiversity uh, in the workforce. Um, not everyone knows exactly the same thing. Not everyone has exactly the same uh, knowledge. Uh, and it's not exactly the same as what went uh, before. So you have a society with a, a radical mixture of what is known and what skills uh, are available. So that's what I mean by biodiversity uh, in, the, uh, in the workforce. And that biodiversity, uh, exactly as the analogy suggests, uh, promotes, of course, resilience. Uh, in the workforce. If things change, you're more likely to find somebody there who has the particular skills and the particular knowledge to cope uh, with that change. And it promotes change, of course, as well, because there is no given uh, direction or given skills uh, to, the, uh, to the workforce. 
So I think uh, if we can summarize then where we've got to, um, it, it, uh, uh, student-centered uh, education uh, produces a, a variety in terms of skills. That variety produces uh, resilience, uh, flexibility, and the ability to cope with change across the whole uh, sector uh, of students who have come out of that uh, uh, kind of system. Okay, that, that's why it's done and maybe what happens. How, how is it done? Uh, well, as I've already said, there's a, there's, there's a pretty wide uh, a range of, of, of practices in UK universities. But let me start with the extreme case uh, of student-centred learning. Uh, and the extreme case is what we get at the university where I now work, at Oxford and also at Cambridge. And there, of course, the centre of the educational system uh, is uh, the so-called tutorial, which is a one-to-one -one meeting between the student and a faculty member. And that's the core uh, of, the, uh, of the teaching experience. What happens uh, in these tutorials? What happens uh, is that there will be a, a discussion between the teacher and the student about what the student wants to do, thinks they should be doing next, There'll be a certain amount of guidance from the, the, the teacher. Uh, a problem will be set and the student is told to go away uh, and write or in some sense solve that problem by herself or himself. Uh, there'll be a bit of guidance in terms of, of, of reading or uh, places on the web you should actually look. But fundamentally, a problem is given and the student, first of all, goes and tries to solve that problem by themselves. They then come back next week to the tutorial and the tutor will say, well, you got some of that right, but you didn't get it all right. You should have read this. You should have gone to that website. You should have tried another solution. Uh, now, now see if you can do it better. But it starts from the student experience of trying to solve the problem. Uh, that's, the, that's the key thing uh, about the uh, tutorial system. And in a way, it's easy to see how that might work if you're thinking about a humanities subject or an art subject. A um, bit more difficult, perhaps, if you're thinking about a science, engineering, or medical subject. But believe you me, that's the way it works uh, there uh, too. Um, it, more recently, but perhaps uh, from about the 1990s in the UK, most universities have switched in medicine uh, to a, a scenario-based approach in which from the very first weeks, the student will be given uh, real medical cases to go away and think about uh, and find out what resources, be given clues as to where to look for resources and come back uh, with some kind of decision about what's going on and what the treatment might be. Now that's radically different, of course, from the traditional way of teaching medicine where you did three years of basic science and then you switched and started to do the clinical, clinical work. But from the 1990s in most, not all universities in the UK, uh, but in most of them, it's scenario-based, problem-based right from the beginning. Uh, and that fits, of course, very well into the kind of tutorial method we've been talking about here, although ironically, Oxford is not one of the universities in medicine uh, which uses that particular uh, teaching, uh, teaching method. In engineering, I know at Liverpool, uh, in, the, uh, in the very first days of uh, being at an engineering class in Liverpool, uh, you're asked to go away and design a bridge or design a building. You're put into teams, uh, three or four of you in a team, and told, uh, Here is the, here's the problem, here's the thing we want built. Uh, go away and, and uh, tell me how you're going to do it. And these, uh, these buildings, these problems in engineering are, are often very real ones. They're ones actually set uh, by Liverpool's uh, business partners who are actually involved in the construction uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these buildings or uh, bridges or, uh, or whatsoever. Uh, and again, what then uh, happens in the, in the extreme, uh, as I say, the extreme case of Oxford or Cambridge, is you come back to your tutor, you discuss what you've done with your tutor, and your tutor says, well, you, as I say, you got this bit right, you got that bit wrong, go away uh, and do, uh, and do uh, 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 more uh, work on it. This kind of uh, uh, teaching, uh, very, very personal, of course, uh, it is also, as you can imagine, really quite challenging for the student. They're face-to-face -face, uh, with somebody of 
professorial standing uh, as often as not. And that can be quite intimidating if you're there yourself or even just uh, uh, if there's uh, two of you there. So there are, there are backup classes, um, usually uh, groups of about 12. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, lectures alongside as well. Um, but the lectures uh, are sort of the icing on the cake. Instead of the lectures being the fundamental part of the course, the lectures are the additional thing uh, to get you excited to learn, to, uh, to talk about something new, and they come after the fundamental interaction uh, of, the, uh, of the tutorial. Most universities, of course, uh, simply can't afford uh, to teach in this way. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, and as the master of a college, I, I, can, I can tell you, it is crazily expensive. Uh, it is seriously expensive. So most universities in the UK, in fact, use seminars, uh, rather like uh, Oxford's classes, uh, something like a dozen people at the, at the, at the better universities. Um, one advantage uh, of the seminar, of course, is that peer learning is good and that it's less intimidating. And it may actually be better for some students. Uh, Oxford, of course, is lucky and it gets very, very... In Oxford and Cambridge are lucky. We get very, very good students. Um, but in other universities around the country, it's possibly a better, less intimidating, less challenging, uh, more gentle way of actually approaching what is fundamentally, however, the same system. Because what happens in the seminar is a couple of people will be told one week, go away and do a presentation on this subject next week. And the students lead the seminar usually uh, the following week. So they start off the discussion. It's not the tutor that starts the discussion, not the teacher who starts the discussion. Uh, it's the students who start the discussion. So even in the seminar-based version of this, it's very, very uh, student-centered and uh, student-led. And then you go through the same kind of process where after the discussion, uh, the teacher will, will jump in as well and say, well, we've, we've missed a few things here. Uh, maybe I suggest you go away and, uh, and read some uh, other stuff or look at some other sites uh, or, uh, or whatever. But it's that, it's that way, uh, that way uh, around. And of course, on top of all this, there are, there are the usual practical classes, uh, labs uh, and so forth and so on, as they would in a traditional uh, institution uh, as well. There's a little interesting historical wrinkle here. Uh, some newer universities in the UK um, set up in the 1960s uh, actually claim to prefer seminars uh, to tutorials. Um, and that goes back to what was happening in Europe in the 1960s. Um, particularly one thinks of the uh, uh, Paris Troubles in 1968, which were in large measure caused by students uh, rebelling against the lecture system uh, and demanding seminars and not lectures. So again, demanding more student-led stuff. And when universities were being set up in the, in the UK at the same time, that kind of cry for seminars uh, uh, was, was taken up as well. And because the traditional institutions had used tutorials uh, for many, many years, the tutorial system in the UK goes back roughly to about 1870. Uh, and indeed, it so happens it was my college which uh, was largely responsible for its uh, introduction uh, in Oxford. Uh, so people in the 1960s said, oh, well, tutorials must be bad because they belong to these traditional institutions. But it wasn't actually tutorials they were rebelling against. Uh, in a sense, they were on the side of tutorials, on the side of uh, uh, student-centered uh, uh, learning too. There's one other uh, big difference in the UK that I need to talk about, and that's the difference between Scotland and England. And I'm not just doing this because I happen to be Scottish, uh, but uh, there is an important difference. Um, the uh, Scottish uh, uh, degree uh, can last for four years uh, instead of three. Now, there is an exit point uh, after three years in Scotland, um, but uh, uh, most people now stay on, and we'll come back to that, most people, bit in a minute, most people stay on and do four years. And the first two years are general studies, pick and mix. Uh, and in most universities, if you're doing something on the art side in these first two years, you also have to do something on the science side and vice versa. So it's a much more general education, and in the last two years you specialize, but you specialize in two subjects, 
not like most English universities, where you only specialise in one. Now there, uh, again, Oxford's a bit different. Oxford had lots of uh, uh, specialist, so-called specialist degrees, but actually cover two or even three subjects, philosophy, politics and economics. There's one degree, very famous Oxford degree. Uh, philosophy and physics, too, a very famous degree, uh, and uh, uh, two subjects. But in Scotland, they're all two subjects, and they're two subjects after two general years. And it's that model which has been exported around the world. It's that model that you'll come across in Australia, uh, you'll come across in the United States, uh, you'll come across in Canada, at uh, many other places. And of course, it has the advantage of being more general, and it has the advantage of delaying the students' choices of subjects further down at the tracks, as it were, further on in their uh, higher education. So there are advantages there. But, again, the fundamental principle is still the same. And, indeed, most Scottish universities taught in the tutorial method, one-to-one, until well into the 1990s, when, unfortunately, again, the financial pressures uh, got the better of them uh, and they moved to a, a, a seminar-based system, but still seminar-based system uh, uh, with student learning uh, at its, uh, at its uh, heart. But whatever, uh, whatever uh, system, um, university learning uh, has to interact with social uh, context uh, in order to work uh, properly. When I was at the University of Glasgow, we had, we had very interesting conversations with the major employers. And the major employers said, uh, we actually prefer the people who do three years of general studies rather than the people who do four years with two years of very specialist studies. We want to employ more of them. The trouble was that their human resources departments weren't listening to their bosses. And uh, although the company heads said, that's the people we want to recruit, that didn't happen. It was the specialists who were recruited. And because the specialists are recruited, reasonably enough, the students voted with their feet, uh, and more and more students do the specialist degrees, and fewer and fewer of them do the general degrees. Uh, and Germany has had a, a, a different version of the same problem uh, after the Bologna reforms, uh, when the, uh, the length of German degrees was seriously shortened, uh, and it was moved into a clear two-stage uh, system. And the German employers, though things are changing now, but it's taken five years even for the beginnings of change, German employers said, we don't like the short degrees. Uh, we only like the old-fashioned long degrees. So when you're changing an educational system, you have to be very careful about how you are actually placing students into the next phase of their life. And there's no use in reforming a system if the, 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 the social context around it has not adapted to actually uh, 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 take account of that change in uh, the university uh, system. And similarly, uh, when the UK system, uh, when, 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 sorry, when overseas students are faced with the UK system, um, if they've been used to a hierarchical system, a system where uh, outcomes are very defined, not student-led, then they find that very difficult. Uh, it is a difficult transition uh, into a student-led uh, system. Uh, and indeed, that's a problem often encountered by UK students when they meet that extreme version at Oxford and Cambridge as well. And they say, well, you know, I need to be told what to do. And uh, at, at Oxford and Cambridge, you know, the teachers will shrug and say, no, go away and find out what to do and come back and tell me what you've done. Uh, and that can be, uh, again, quite challenging. So one's got to be careful about that in thinking about simply internationalising uh, the system. It won't work without careful preparation and without that social context uh, around you. Key then to student le uh, learning, uh, uh, you've, got to, you've got to ask the question, what outcome are you looking for? Uh, is the surrounding context uh, supportive? What you will get? from student-centred learning, scenario-based learning, um, problem-based learning, is um, 
a more flexible workforce, possibly at the expense of predictability. More flexible, but possibly at the expense of predictability. But it will be more resilient, using that biodiversity uh, analogy again, more resilient to d disease, more resilient to troubles, and more open to change. Thank you very much for uh, listening this morning. It's, as I say, it's been a pleasure uh, coming back here. Thank you.